Oh, good evening. Tonight I thought I would talk about social distancing. It's a buzzword these days as people are concerned with the spread of sickness. So there's a call for people to engage in social distancing. I think it's a unique opportunity because we have so many people in the world engaging in a similar activity that may be quite different from how they normally act, how they normally behave. And moreover, an activity that is very close to the sorts of things recommended in Buddhism. Because social distancing is a way of looking inside. It's a way of focusing your attention on your own being. And so it goes quite well with mental development and introspection and <clears throat> developing understanding of the nature of one's own mind. If done, if done well, and so of course it's not to say that just by practicing social distancing you somehow become wiser and understand yourself more. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how Buddhists engage in social distancing or how one might engage properly in social distancing for for a, for beneficial results uh, for for it to be a beneficial activity so it's not to say that one should also always be socially distant but it has to be acknowledged and buddhism does try to help people to acknowledge that if we're constantly caught up in society We'll have very little opportunity to understand ourselves, very little progress in understanding the nature of our minds in terms of what is causing us stress and suffering and how we might change that. So as with all things, social distancing is in the physical realm. We're not talking about becoming mentally distant. Well, there's no call in the world right now for people to be emotionally or mentally distant from each other. No, we're talking about something physical, and so on the face it actually doesn't have anything to do with Buddhism. But as with all things, it, uh, it, all things physical, the quality of it depends very much on the state of the mind as one performs the act. And moreover, the performing of certain physical acts can facilitate the evoking of certain mind states. So when we do walking meditation and sitting meditation, you might say, well, it's just physical, what use is that? But by engaging in such a simple activity, we give the mind an opportunity to flower, to, to blossom, to, uh, give, to, to do its work because it's not preoccupied with complicated movements. And so, one good way to look at any physical activity is in, from, as, as in terms of it being beneficial or harmful and the different ways in which you could undertake it that might be harmful is what we call the four agati. Uh, agati is uh, loosely translated as partialities or biases, biases better. But literally it means um, what you're led by, I think, what leads you. And so we do certain things, we're led by this or we're led by that. Um...
And there are four reasons why one might do something, what leads one or what one has uh, gone over to uh, as a reason for doing something physical. The same goes, of course, with speech, anything in the in the physical realm. And these four are chanda. We do something based on uh, desire or liking it, or, or, or liking in general. Dosa, we do something based on anger. Bhaya, we do something based on fear. And moha, we do something based on delusion. These are the four agati. They're all they're all bad reasons to do something. So we'll talk about them, and then we'll talk about some of the right reasons to do things, or how to make things, especially things like social distancing, really beneficial. And to avoid making them problematic, because something so extreme for many people, as social distancing can have debilitating effects, can have negative effects. So Chandagam, Chanda, Chandagati is uh, parsi or the bias of partiality or of of liking, and this encompasses all kinds of desire, all kinds of greed. So people might social distance because uh, of stinginess, miserliness. Misers become very distant. Because of people asking them for for donations and gifts and so on, loans often. I met a woman in Thailand when I was living there. Um, I met her a few times. Once we went to, I was with Ajahn Tong quite often, my teacher, and she would every time she came, she was not. She was very rich, and she was quite exceptional. I've never met anyone like her. Everywhere she went, when she met a monk especially, because she had great confidence and great um, respect for the monastic life, she would always give something. I remember going up to uh, to, to sit in on, on the, the reporting of the meditators, the meetings with between the teacher and the meditator, and she was there. And she saw me come up. And she had just been giving out uh, gifts to the monks, and she saw me there, and immediately she thought, and she looked in, and she had a pen in her purse. She looked in her purse, and she said, here, I would like to give you a gift of a pen. But for most people, it's not like that. She, she, um, we went to her house once, and she was talking about all the many... Uh, requests for donations that she would get. She would get letters and letters every day from teachers and firefighters and police and so on. Everybody asking for a donation. And so for most people this becomes too much. Rich people it becomes too much. For, for ordinary people as well we become quite distant if we think people are going to or if people are constantly asking for Loans or gifts or so on, and this is problematic. You, you, you. To some extent, you have to protect yourself if people are greedy and and they're clingy or so on. Uh, but it can't be because of your own greed. It has to be, of course, because of something more beneficial. For some people, they get very greedy and and therefore keep to themselves because they don't want to share. For things like social distancing, for most people it's not going to be like that, but the results of having to seclude yourself for many people are quite devastating. Um, lack, loss of livelihood for students, loss of education. You know. For some people it can lead to great stress having to be in close quarters with, other, with others, so you call it social distancing, but in fact it puts you close to people who you might have a hard time being close to, your family members, sometimes you might not get along, siblings, even children and with their parents and so on. 
But in some cases it can, I think, perhaps be an excuse for increased uh, engagement in sensuality. So for many people, students, a chance to stay at home and not have to go to school might seem like a chance to just play games all the time or watch television all the time. For some people it might just be an, a means of relaxing, of being lazy. Of, for some people driven by stress, the stress of, of all the other reasons, all the other problems associated with um, the pandemic and sickness and so on. Uh, it can drive them to I increased entertainment and things like binge eating and, and so on. And as a result, there's a lot of problems that come from this. As a result, um, there will be increased uh, irritability you know, for someone who is constantly engaged in entertainment and, and enjoyment of sensuality. They have the increased capacity of becoming angry, irritated, annoyed. Uh, it leads to fighting among siblings and families and loved ones. So a big reason perhaps why people engaging in this sort of social uh, distancing are having stress, having to stay at home as a family is because of their incapacity to be content, um, to be at peace. And so constantly fighting over what television program we're going to watch or uh, fighting over belongings and money, fighting over all sorts of things that should bring, are supposed to bring pleasure and instead bring great suffering. So when engaging in, in this sort of activity, you have to be mindful of the sorts of things like sensuality and craving and, and so on. You have to, because uh, it, it might be seen as a license or an opportunity to increase in our our activity, our engagement in entertainment, and so on, which is problematic. The second reason, um, based on anger, so social distancing based on anger might easily be carried out by someone who is racist. You'll see people who don't want to associate it with people of other races or skin colors or even nationalities and languages and cultures, religions. Religion is a very common one based on anger or hatred, uh, ethnicity, hatred of other ethnicities. And you see this even with the uh, current pandemic, you hear about... Uh, people uh, avoiding others or out of and becoming very angry at at people based on their their looks, their ethnicity, at Chinese people because there's an understanding that the disease originated in China, and so there's uh, an increase in racism, as I understand, r relating to Chinese people. But there are many opportunities for the arising of anger. We get angry at people who um, perhaps seem to have done something negligent. You get angry at people who don't practice social distancing. Or you just social distance, you distance yourself from people with a cruel, angry attitude. You know, our attitude when we distance, our attitude when we do anything is so important. You might feel self-righteous when you do something, thinking it's the right thing to do. Um, but your your way of doing, and, and it very well might be, but it becomes quite unwholesome if it's done with the wrong attitude. And so someone tries to shake our hands and we shy away from them angrily and say, what are you doing? And so on. We turn a cold shoulder, we act cold towards others. All of it boils down to a lack of mindfulness. If a person has mindfulness, they're able to interact with others in a way that is harmonious, in a way that is free from any kind of cruelty, any kind of um, harshness. 
And so it's a very good example of how we really have a responsibility to ourselves and to others for the purpose of bringing and maintaining peace and happiness to act in a way that is free from qualities like anger. And absolutely, of course, we can't be uh, mean to uh, refugees is apparently a thing we have to be conscientious you know in in there are many ways we can make it quite easy by closing our borders to refugees and so on that uh, that end up being more harmful or or well, you know, whether you can balance what is more harmful, what is less harmful, but, but end up being quite cruel um, and needlessly cruel, because of course the alternative is is more difficult. You know, if you let refugees in during this time, you know, you, you have to. It's it can be challenging to deal with them, and rather than deal with the challenge, it's an example of how we just act cruelly. So with something like social distancing, you know, there may be times where compassion overrides. Perhaps someone has hurt themselves and you don't know who this person is, you've never met them, you see them on the street and they've hurt, fallen down or something. And you go and, you know, I'm not sure if you're even allowed to pick people up, you don't know. But anyway, cases where you might have to break your, your quarantine, for example. And then just wash your hands, you know, instead of being, oh, I can't help this person because that would endanger me to, you know, with this sickness. In fact, in many cases, you might think, you know, in a life or death situation, you might, of course, throw out any kind of caution, any kind of sense of something like social distancing. And you have to be thoughtful of what is, what is a better thing to do. And you see this, I think, with uh, people, uh, countries closing their borders to refugees. Of course, I'm not a politician. I don't know the details, but it's something that has to be done quite thoughtfully, conscientiously, in terms of the, the negative impact, potential negative impact, and cruelty involved. The third reason why we do things is uh, through fear. And I think this is the probably the most common emotion among the negative reasons or qualities of mind uh, that we engage in when we distance ourselves in these times. A lot of people afraid, doing it out of fear. And fear is fear is a great motivator. We are quick to use fear as a means of motivating ourselves. We, we allow it many times, and we allow it to uh, per persist because it appears to motivate us, and it does. I mean, fear is stressful. Fear is, is an exciter. And as a result, it gets the mind working. But of course, that's just a sign that before the fear, our mind wasn't working properly. We weren't thoughtful. We become thoughtful about something when it scares us. How can we fix it? How can we deal with it? But as you know with fear it doesn't it doesn't encourage us to think rationally. It doesn't always or necessarily or really have the quality of encouraging or promoting or augmenting our wisdom, our, our mindfulness our sense of presence when we deal with a problem, and it becomes quite reactionary. And so we, we have to sometimes question our, uh, our level of, of reactivity, our level of action in relation to things like social distancing. And a, a, a good example, it's a, it, it works for all of these, like with... Um, for many people, I think social distancing is is not that 
um, tr troublesome or burdensome. For many people, it is, but for I mean, in some ways, it can be it can seem quite pleasant. So, so people engaging in it or, or agreeing to engage in it, you see the world. It's quite quick to engage in this social distancing because, in some ways, it it subconsciously is quite pleasant. Or out of anger, we do things rashly. You know, we engage in social distancing, knee-jerk reaction, out of anger, you know, the, the the aversion towards sickness. I don't want to get sick. You know, so it can be irrational. We haven't thought about it. We haven't thought about what is the the real benefit, and so our actions are often irrational. And fear is the same. We, we do things. A lot of the fear going on has caused people to do things that are in many ways unhelpful. And sometimes it's unhelpful without realizing. You do things thinking they're going to be helpful, like wear masks or so on. And apparently, well, I don't know. It's an example. that There was some talk about how the masks aren't helping, but I don't know if they are. But in cases like this, people buying great amounts of toilet paper, for example, was a big thing. You know, just mass hysteria or mass panic. And sometimes panic can help you. You know, you did something and it, it, it physically, maybe you did get all the toilet paper in the store, but it can be quite unwholesome and unpleasant because, of course, you, other people then who need an ordinary amount of toilet paper can't get any. And it causes us to act irrationally and, and with any, without it causes us to lose our regard for uh, propriety, rightness. Fear is a stimulator. And so it can often appear to be helpful. But we can see from the results of, of hysteria, of fear, that, that it in fact takes us away from a sense of calm, clear, measured understanding of the situation. The fourth reason why we do things, why we might do something, is out of delusion. And so something like social distancing, as with anything, we have to consider, we have to ask ourselves, ask ourselves is it proper to be doing and so on. People who engage out of delusion might be just be doing it because other people have told them to do it. You know, people engage in, in seclusion out of arrogance and conceit. Thinking you're better than someone causes you to distance yourself. But with something like social distancing in this, in this case, the pandemic, uh, a really good example is of how we engage in social distancing because everyone else is doing it, because we have an idea that it's going to keep us safe from, from sickness, um, but we do it haphazardly. You know, we do it with a disconnect from reality. You know, we often do this, the herd mentality, everybody's doing it, okay, this will keep me safe, the thing about wearing the masks and so on. And then we engage in other activities, which of course are, are which are, happen to be... Um, you know, nullifying any benefit that we might get from social distancing. Like we still, we don't shake people's hands, but we touch doorknobs in public places, and then we pick our nose or we scratch our face or so on. And so, um, it's an example, or it's it's an example that shows the difference between being mindful and being unmindful. The unmindful state is one that. Uh, causes us to engage in activities that are potentially harmful to ourselves simply because of the darkness, because of the lack of clarity, the lack of awareness. With the mindful of delusion, we do many things that are contrary to our, our intention. So we engage in social distancing, but um, again, we... we, we take produce from the grocery store and without washing it we 
put it, eat it, to put it in our mouths, and so on. And just doing things unmindfully, like picking your nose after you've, you know, whatever, sucking on your thumb, or something that causes us to negate any benefit in the worldly sense of uh, something like social distancing. So, ultimately the right way, or the right way to engage in something like this, social distancing, is of course with mindfulness, you know, with, with wisdom. And so it's important that we learn about why we're doing everything that we do. When we do something like social distancing, we learn about it, we study it. It's a kind of wisdom. It, it shows us a sort of mindfulness, our um, deliberate engagement in, in understanding what it is that we're doing so that we do it properly. You know, the internet is a wonderful thing now for information, our capacity to learn about the proper ways to do things, the benefits of certain things and, and how to make things beneficial in a worldly sense. We have to think about um, how we're going to engage in this sort of social distancing, what we have to plan out, how we engage in the world and so on. But most importantly, we have to be mindful. Anything that could be quite radical like this, where we have to remove ourselves from our ordinary activity, where we have to leave our social circle and we have to um, remember not to shake people's hands, not to kiss people's cheeks, not to um, touch a door handle, for example, or if we've touched a door handle, to wash our hands before we touch our face and so on. We have to, be, we have to remember all of that, which means we have to be conscious, we have to be present. It's very easy to have as a theory, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, when the time comes... It all gets thrown out of the window because you're just not mindful. And so, above many, above most things, most especially, when you engage in something like social distancing, in Buddhists we have a great uh, wealth of experience relating to things like social distancing. You, 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 you absolutely need a proper state of mind. You need to be present. It's an example of an activity where mindfulness is crucial. Because, of course, when you're alone, you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy if you're not mindful, if you're not able to be present, or you'll be driven to distraction. You'll just engage in sensual uh, indulgence and cultivate addiction and so on. Or you'll fight with your family. You'll, you'll engage in... In anger, you'll you'll build up fear and hysteria and panic. You'll develop. You'll, you'll cultivate delusion, your ego and conceit and so on. Based on, based on your, um, based on your seclusion, because there's a there, there's an inward focus of course when you distance yourself from others and so if your mind is bent in the wrong way the inward focus is going to uh, magnify that and the effects are going to be magnified because you're focused inward any negative any of these four the the, the greed the anger the fear the delusion any of these, when focused inward, are going to make you sick. And so if, we're, if our true uh, goal in this social distancing is to be free from sickness, well, absolutely, all that always, mental illness is going to trump any kind of physical illness. And so our concern of, over physical illness is important, yes, Social distancing is useful simply for the fact that it prevents and, and reduces 
the likelihood of us getting sick or the, the, the speed at which the pandemic uh, spreads and so on. But if it's engaged in, in such a way that it increases our mental illness, then we haven't accomplished anything at all. So, food for thought and a good reason for us to engage in meditation at this time. Absolutely, now that um, in this time of social distancing, We have a, a unique opportunity for um, for so much meditation practice that we should take the opportunity. We should take it as as a real special opportunity for us to try this practice of developing and and working on our minds. Of course, our center is shut down, so we aren't accepting new meditators, and I assume most meditation centers are as well, but uh, there are many ways to practice meditation, many resources for you to practice meditation on your own. You can read books on how to meditate. We have a booklet on how to meditate. Um, and, and we also have a stay-at-home course that we all have had for a long time where people who practice at home, they do at least an hour of meditation a day, and we meet, we, we, we talk on, on a voice call once a week, and give a new exercise, because of course the booklet that we have only gives the basic exercise, so every week we give you a new exercise, adding to the challenge and, and pushing you further to, to train your mind to see clearly, to be present, and to understand yourself. So I encourage absolutely everyone during this time, this is a prime opportunity to practice meditation if you haven't, or to increase your practice if you're already practicing. And absolutely, if you're interested in taking a meditation course at home, you can look on our website, sirimangalo.org, under the courses, and you you can read about it. So those are my thoughts on social distancing. Just thought I would do a video on it. And I wish you all the best in this in these trying times. And I hope everyone is able to stay calm and peaceful inside. And that internally and externally we all find peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. Thank you. I wish you all the best.